So you've talked about what is policy purgatory for the Federal Reserve. Explain what you mean. So it's this notion that you cannot deliver outcomes and yet you cannot stop from doing more. So you're stuck in this muddled middle where you know deep inside that on your own you cannot end up where you want to be but you can't get out and that's where the Fed is today. The Fed is unable to deliver the economic outcomes that they wish to deliver that we all want them to because they need the politician to cooperate and yet they can't step away from an approach that's getting more and more imperfect. Yet it hasn't really worked. I mean they've got a dual mandate and it's, it's done fine in terms of sort of creating that wealth effect and certainly helped prop up the stock market, but it hasn't done fine in terms of job creation. Why not? Very simple. The reason why people aren't investing, the reason why people aren't hiring is because there are structural impediments in our economy. There's no clarity about the fiscal outlook. People are not quite sure what's going to happen. Credit pipes that used to get money to small and medium-term enterprises are still clogged up. They haven't been cleaned up. Our labor market isn't functioning properly. Too many job, too many people got employed in, in construction, in real estate. It's not coming back. And finally, our education system has lacked. So there's a sense that these are deeply embedded issues. They need not just the Fed, but other government agencies to do their homework. And right now, the Fed is the only one. Housing is the other issue. So many years in, into the housing crisis, and we still haven't sorted it out. So that's why all the Fed can do is buy time for other institutions to get their act together, but it cannot on its own deliver the outcomes. Was this last round of QE3 almost too aggressive a move? I and mean, when you talk about buying time, they could have done other things besides stepping in and buying up mortgage-backed securities for an indefinite period of time. Yeah, there was two things that were quite aggressive. I didn't say too aggressive, I said quite aggressive. First, an open-ended program. And secondly, wording that lots of people haven't quite realized. They said that they will keep their foot on the accelerator well into the recovery. So they don't, they don't just want to get the economy to recover, well into the recovery. What I view this as is very simple. The dual mandate is no longer equal. Today, employment has been brought up, brought up relative to inflation, right? And the Fed is committed because it knows that with long-term unemployment, with high youth unemployment, if we don't deal with this crisis today, it will get embedded in the structure of the economy and we will have a lost generation. This is a conversation that you and I have been having now for quite some time, though. What is it about this situation this, and it is dire at this point when it comes to job creation, that Congress doesn't get and seems to refuse to act, both Republicans and Democrats. That's really, really complex. I think there's lots of things going on, lots of things. The most important thing is that we as a society got hooked on leverage, on debt, and on credit entitlement. We believed that we could owe things, we can consume, not relative to our income, but relative to our credit. It took many years to create the situation. It's going to take many years to undo it. When you undo it, you have to start allocating losses. You have to decide what sort of burden sharing do you want among society. And our politicians have very different view as to what is fair. And because they can't agree, and because they've committed to all sorts of idiotic things, they are frozen. We get bickering and dithering instead of action. At the end of the day, this is a cooperative game, as the economist said. You need people to cooperate and come together. And until they do, our problems are going to get worse, not better. So it really concerns me if what you're saying is true, because that means this looming fiscal cliff, which everybody is obviously worried about, could actually happen. I mean, they won't step in in time to fix it. What they won't do is fix it properly. So the most likely outcome is that in the lame duck session after the election or shortly thereafter, they will come up with some mini bargain that will basically kick the can down the road. Yet again. Yet again, right? Will not give clarity to investors, will not jumpstart this economy properly, and we are going to have the same issues. It is amazing to me, amazing to me, right, that the simple approach of let's threaten catastrophe 
in order to get people to agree, because after all, no one wants to push a country over the fiscal cliff. No one wants to push a country to recession. Hasn't worked. Which could happen. It could happen, it absolutely could happen. It's, it's a risk, it's not a baseline, it's a risk. The best we can hope for, unfortunately, is about 1.5% growth. And you and I are gonna be talking, even if we get 1.5% growth, and ask, what about stall speed? This notion is you're growing, but you're not growing rapidly. And it does worry me. It worries me most as a parent. I have a nine-year-old, and if we're not careful, we're going to leave our children in a situation that hasn't occurred for a very long time, which is they may be worse off than their parents' generation. And that hasn't happened for a very long time. Corporations, until they get clarity, aren't going to spend the money that they've got, and they have plenty of it at this point, and continue to get more until there is some kind of clarity, correct? Correct. So what about this can't Congress understand? It's, it's so blatant at this point. I mean, the Federal Reserve has basically spelled it out and said, hey, we've done everything. How much more time can they possibly buy? Now you've got to go up to Washington to ask that question. I think it doesn't help to have two-year election cycles because people are worried about election. It also hasn't helped that our po politicians haven't been completely open with the person in the street. So the person in the street still thinks there are choices. There aren't actually that many choices. At the end, whether it's the Democrats or the Republicans, the engineering solution will be the same. There will be important choices to make about social questions, really important ones, but the economic side is not going to be that different. Okay, so I think we just have to keep on stressing to our politicians that the longer they wait, the bigger the problem and the harder the solutions. Are you not as worried then about some of these other sort of tail risks that are out there, such as the Eurozone crisis, such as, you know, this fiscal cliff? I mean, are you more, what is the most concerning thing to you? So there's a list of five, if you want to take me there, and we can get quite depressed, <laughs> okay? So the first one is the fiscal cliff. That could send the U.S. into recession and the world into recession. The second one is Greece. Greece, by itself, can disrupt the Eurozone. The third one is the geopolitics. What's happening in Iran you remember, as Tom Friedman of the New York Times said, there are certain societies when they're destabilized, they explode in the sense that they destabilize countries around them. So the third one is Iran. The fourth one is Spain. Spain now has conditional access to unlimited financing, but if they don't get their act together, they're not going to get that. And I'm missing the fifth one. It's going to come to me in a sec. <laughs> but the, the, but the, there's a fifth one. Um, can't, anyway, there's a list of five that I worry about every single day. Yeah. Is there anything else that you want to touch on that we haven't? I think that we, we also have to realize that while there are bad tales, Tell there, me are, good ones. there are good ones. Like Let one. me give you a few good ones. Yeah. Okay. One is the cash that you mentioned. There's so much cash on the sideline. Crazy. If we manage somehow to give confidence to investors, that by itself can put us in a really good place because there's lots of money to invest, lots of jobs to be created. Secondly, there are meaningful technological changes going on, really meaningful. Right? They by themselves can also change. I remember what the fifth risk was, China. And it, China is managing what's called the middle income transition. It happens about $5,000 to $6,000 GDP. And in history, and this is Mike Spence, the Nobel Prize winner, has done a lot of work on that. In history, only five countries, five countries, have managed this transition at high speed. And China is operating at high speed. So what China is facing today is also risk. So tonight, I have the pleasure of, of giving you the Louise Lewin uh, Award for the, the summit and leadership and, and the amazing things that you've done with regard to business acumen. How does it feel to receive that? I feel honored. I feel incredibly privileged, but I also feel very intimidated because I think this award doesn't really celebrate me as much as celebrates the people and the institutions and the ideas that have influenced me. You know, growing up, and I'm going to speak about it, growing up, I was described as boring and unimaginative. That's really? How, that's how people saw me. So I was, I'm very lucky that I had access to people, to institutions, and to ideas that allowed me to apparently do something good.